Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, USA. So I'm Anders Ekelund from uh, Hexagon, like IEO Systems. And uh, today I have my colleague with me, Ron Roth, uh, who is based in USA. I am responsible for um, like a bathymetric LiDAR portfolio, and I will start up with that. And then after me, Ron Roth will give some introduction to uh, the uh, topographic LiDAR portfolio. So um, um, the Leica airborne bathymetric products are called the Kyapsha 4X and Hawkeye 4X. They are widely used in the North America. So uh, by companies like Wolpert, Quantum Spatial, for end users like NOAA and uh, Canadian Hydrographic Services. So um, the system consists of, of um, one uh, shallow bathymetric shallow, one topographic channel. And if you add the Hawkeye deep module, you have a deep uh, uh, bathymetric channel as well. They are built for really uh, maximizing depth penetration and um, object detection and in, in all different conditions. So especially turbid water is crucial and it's scalable from shallow to deep. Together with the systems, we also provide the full bathymetric workflow. And, and this is very important. Uh, so um, I, I um, sketched some of the important uh, parts here. So uh, LiDAR calibration fully integrated. For uh, all hydrographic data needs to be uh, corrected due to the water surface location. It's called the water refraction correction. And this sounds easy in, 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 in uh, sea environments where the water is flat, but we also have environments where you have very, very complex uh, water surface in complex river environments and so on. Um, in our products, we also have a waveform-based classification integrated. So, so that's a classification made already in the processing stage of the waveforms, so no spate shell filtering at all. We have different kinds of visualizations. We have a lot of different algorithms integrated to enhance the data as, for example, turbid water enhancement. And this bathymetric uh, LiDAR workflow is done in a software called the LiDAR Survey Studio. So that's, that's our post-processing software before you push the point cloud into other softwares for, for uh, uh, spatial filtering and, and editing. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the enhancements that we have done over the last year in our bathymetric LiDAR portfolio. And um, as we have not uh, released a new product, we have still made a lot of enhancements. And um, this is integrated in the LiDAR Survey Studio 3.0, so the new release of, of the LiDAR Survey Studio software. And um, it's a full complete um, additional uh, algorithm package that has gone in. And really the purpose for those were, first of all, um, to simplify for, uh, for the processing persons doing the processing. Um, it's quite complex in different water conditions to set different threshold settings and so on to get the most optimal out of the data. And um, that has been done by simplified threshold settings. Uh, we wanted to uh, improve the data accuracy, not because it was bad before, but because we had some ideas on what we could do to improve uh, the accuracy in the data. Uh, we also saw some options to improve the depth penetration to increase the sensitivity of the sensor, which um, actually also leads to uh, reduced noise in the water column and also improved uh, object detection of, of small objects in the seabed and uh, on the seabed or in the water volume. However, always when you integrate this kind of additional algorithms, you have the problem that that also increase the computational power uh, needed and uh, time is money as everyone knows. So we also wanted to keep the similar processing time as a key requirement for LiDAR Service Studio 3.0. 
So um, the water conditions can be very, very different between different areas and, and can also even vary in, within an area. So within the same flight line, you can have relatively clear water, then you have a, some wastewater coming out from or a river mouth uh, that creates a higher turbidity. And uh, really, during the waveform processing, um, to optimize, you, you, you really need to optimize for the water conditions. And then um, this was a little bit tricky, and we wanted to simplify. Uh, and in order to do that, so then we have developed an um, um, algorithm in, in the software that actually measures the water turbidity, the local water turbidity, and adapt it for you. So um, this um, both leads to that, that um, the, uh, the operator to do the processing doesn't need to optimize this himself. And in addition, it, it's get more optimal because now in each location in the flight line, there is a water turbidity map. Uh, so the software knows itself how to optimize for, for that specific um, water condition. Then on the improved accuracy, so this is also um, algorithm development. Um, of course, in, in, in the Bethy LiDAR, it's a lot of dis different uh, disturbances. You have the water surfaces with different wave models. You have um, uh, scattering in the water volume and so on. Um, here is a comparison um, between um, the LiDAR Survey Studio 2.50 and uh, the uh, LiDAR Survey Studio 3.0. So it's compared against the uh, multi-beam data set. I hope you see my mouse. The, uh, the red curve is, is the previous version and the green curve is the uh, new version. And you can see that especially on the uh, deeper depths, uh, we have a better accuracy, a better RMS value um, compared to the previous version. Further on depth penetration. So um, this is what you typically get from uh, the previous version. It's an area in France uh, from one of our customers there. And um, now in, in this case, I've turned on both the, uh, the uh, what's classified as, as a water surface, what's classified as noise points. So this, the, the noise points are the magenta points uh, it's also the blue points which are classified as, as seabed points in, in our waveform classification. And um, if you look accurately in this data, you can see that uh, the classification is mostly correct, but there are um, faulty uh, classified uh, seabed points in, in the water volume. And um, also, if you look into the seabed data, there, there are faulty noise points in, in the seabed data. Uh, in the previous version. And uh, this is before any spatial filtering. So, so this data would go into spatial filtering afterwards. So this is pure waveform based classification that, that you get directly after the first processing in, in LiDAR Survey Studio. However, if, if we look into the 3.0 results, you can actually, first of all, you can see that we have reached deeper. So significantly deeper. Um, in this data set. And uh, we also have uh, very few seabed returns that are faulty classified in this area uh, until the maximum depth penetration of the LiDAR. When we turn on the noise points, which are weaker points, we can see that there is actually a bit extra here to extract. And, and uh, many of our customers do that by, by, by spatial filtering in afterwards. Uh, but uh, you have a solid base uh, from, from, from the first LiDAR class, uh, waveform classification. And it's also significant less uh, faulty classified seabed points in, in the water volume. And this was really what we wanted to achieve. Um, so what does this make? Uh, this is an example from a, a demo project in the Stockholm archipelago. And you can see it's a quite complex area with a lot of small uh, islands, uh, very rocky. And of course, it's also very rocky beneath the water surface. The water conditions are not great here, not extremely bad either, but, but uh, 
typical for the Baltic Sea. So here is the LSS 2.50 results. And um, you can see if I add the 3.0 results that we, we have received uh, significantly deeper. Um, if you look into um, a two meter grid uh, created from this, uh, you can see that there are actually structures here in the data that, that are not visible in, in, in the 2.50 results. Uh, so uh, this is of course a big benefit. Um, if we look into um, the um, um, a cross cat, you can see that with the previous version in, in this specific area, we reached about 10.3 meters uh, with, with, with uh, the additional, uh, with the new software, we, we reach about 12.3 here, so about 20% increase. I have another um, image here showing the same. We can see uh, roughly that, that uh, roughly 20% uh, increase in this area. This is a little bit different in different areas. So, so we haven't really updated the specifications due to this, but uh, it, it has uh, improved in, in, in the depth penetration of the system. Further, um, object detection is, is very important in, in bathymetric LiDAR. And um, for objects, it's both important with the size of your object, but also how dark the object is. And this is actually quite interesting area. It's, 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 it's from France, where you have some very bright seabed and some very, very dark objects, so, so uh, and dark seabed. So actually, if you look into this data, it, it, is, a, it is a dark object there. And um, um, in the LSS 2.50 results, you, 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 uh, I, you can see the points. I, I think that our customers would not have missed it, but you can also see that there are some, some uh, noise points in the water volume that, that can trick you. If you go over to the LSS 3.0 results, you can see that we have a much, much better coverage here on the object. So uh, if you make a comparison, you can see much better detection of the object and uh, uh, noise points in, in the water volume. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we made um, a more bigger test out of this. So uh, this is from our test area in Lake Vetten, Sweden. And uh, the good thing with this test area is that we have a lot of natural stones and boulders on the seafloor, uh, various sizes. So uh, what we did was we did a very accurate multi-beam survey area, uh, survey of, of this um, um, survey area. We identified about 100 different objects, uh, so stones and boulders, and they were between half a meter high to about, the highest was about 1.8 meter. And of course, the most of them are, are smaller. So, so it's, it's a higher distribution to the smaller objects. The depths in this area are uh, zero to 10 meters. Uh, the depth penetration we typically get in this area with the system is about 15 meters. So, so it's about two thirds of, of, of uh, the uh, depth extinction of the system. So every of those objects were, were categorized, uh, vectorized uh, in a GIS database with height and size and so on. And um, then we can do a comparison between the two different versions. So, um, um, and there are some important figures here. So we can see it was totally 106 objects in this case. And um, with uh, the LSS 2.50 versus LSS 3.0. You can see that uh, with the previous version, we detected 37% of those objects, and with the new version, 91%. So it's, it's a significant increase of, of the number of objects detected. And also maybe more importantly is, is that um, um, is the number of returns on the object detected. And uh, there, you can see that in, in the previous version, in the objects detected, it was uh, quite a bit of them that, that was only detected by one, two or three returns. But now due to the increased sensitivity of the system and, and, and the scattering, we, we actually detect all of the objects detected had more than four, four returns. And this, this makes it more um, 
solid in, in, in the um, spatial filtering that is going on in afterwards, yet not to delete the objects that actually are detected. Uh, you can also see here that uh, we have object detected by depth. Of course, the objects on the deepest are most difficult to detect and object by size. And also here, um, of course, the, the larger objects, the easier it is to detect them. Finally, on processing time, so uh, this is um, a, a graph over the different uh, processing times for different types of computers. We had a 2019 recommendation, um, including batch processing, so that was released last year. And we have a recommendation on 2020. If you look into this figure, so first of all, you can't do the processing on any laptop anymore. I mean, that's, that's just taking far too much time. Uh, so this is processing hour versus uh, hours online. So basically, if you fly one second, it would take 23 seconds to, to, uh, to uh, process. Here, it's about three seconds for, for the same um, on this batch processing. If you look here, between 3 and 1.3, that's actually improvements of, of, of algorithms. So, so uh, that's kind of the same algorithms running, but, but more efficiently. And then when we add new algorithms, we are up to 2.6 hours here. And um, uh, same for the new. So, so about same processing time as before, but with all the improvements integrated. So with that, I say thanks for myself. I hand over to my colleague, Ron, to say a few words about the top of LiDAR. All right, thank you, Anders. And I'll share my screen now. <clears throat> what I'll do now is to give you just a really quick update on uh, where we are with our current city mapper and terrain mapper products, as well as to provide a kind of preview of coming attractions. So with that, We've been uh, developing these oblique camera systems like our City Mapper for a number of years now, and the latest version is the City Mapper 2, which takes advantage of our new MFC 150 camera heads, uh, 650 megapixel camera heads in this same device, as well as a full function LiDAR uh, derived from our Terrain Mapper product. So with the City Mapper 2, what we designed was a system designed for high resolution images targeted at a five centimeter GSD, uh, with a flexibility of flying at a number of different flying heights. We have two configurations, a standard altitude and a high altitude. We wanted to make the system fly at pretty much any speed that a typical survey aircraft would uh, deliver and still give you an 80% forward overlap. And we wanted to provide a full workflow for data collection and processing. In the end, what we've done is uh, introduce a system that is simpler to operate, and has roughly double the productivity of the previous generation. Uh, at a five centimeter GSD, uh, City Mapper 2S, the standard height version, would fly at about 1500 meters flying height, which gives you plenty of room for tall objects below you. And it would uh, cover about a 700 meter swath and still give you uh, 14 points per square meter on the LIDAR. Uh, likewise, we can do something uh, analogous to that with the high altitude version flying at almost two kilometers flying height and get uh, six and a half points per square meter on the LIDAR and still get that same five centimeter GSD. Uh, what's maybe even more interesting is if you really push the sensor down to a two and a half centimeter GSD, of course, you're flying lower. That means faster frame rates and things like that. And uh, what's possible with the new City Mapper 2 is to be able to acquire this two and a half centimeter data at, uh, at these uh, normal survey aircraft speeds of 120 knots and still get an 80% forward overlap where our prior generations of systems, you might have to fly in a helicopter to get that kind of forward overlap. So really increases the flexibility of the system. And what this allows us to do is to essentially use City Mapper 2 in a greater variety of applications, including uh, both uh, typical city profiling, city modeling applications, which is the, the bread and butter of uh, these oblique imaging systems, but also to do linear projects like power lines, roads, or railways, 
or even uh, traditional regional mapping projects as you might do with, uh, uh, with a typical LIDAR system. So it's really uh, a multi-use system. What this takes advantage of is our new compact camera models, uh, modules, the MFC 150s. Uh, these are 150 megapixel uh, camera, uh, very high dynamic range, fine pixel pitch, and a uh, high resolution uh, A to D converter. And we can operate six of these at a, a frame interval of as small as about uh, nine tenths of a second. And this is what allows you to fly at normal survey aircraft speeds and still get an 80% forward overlap. Uh, we can do shutter speeds up to a thousandth of a second, but really that's not the important part. Um, you uh, need to be able to operate at lower uh, 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 shutter speeds, uh, slower shutter speeds when you have less optimal lighting conditions. And that's where a key feature of the MFC 150 comes in, that of forward motion compensation. Uh, of course, the system is designed to operate with a very long lifetime for its uh, shutter and forward motion compensation mechanics uh, and operates over a wide temperature range. And we use lenses that are specially coated. Uh, all the optical coatings are optimized for either RGB or near IR, depending on the camera head. So let's take a look at a couple of quick images from uh, the City Mapper 2. In the yellow box that you see down in the lower part of the screen, uh, this is all taken from a flight at about 700 meters above terrain, a two and a half centimeter nominal uh, GSD at Nader. This is fairly low sun angle uh, imagery. And if we zoom in on what's in the yellow box, uh, well, we're not quite violating any general data privacy regulations, but we're getting close. Uh, and you can see the level of detail that's uh, in this image, even in the shadowed areas. Uh, likewise, as I mentioned, forward motion compensation is really important, especially when you have these suboptimal uh, solar illumination angles, uh, low lighting conditions, uh, the example on the left here shows a five centimeter image acquired with the uh, forward motion compensation. Uh, and on the right hand side of the uh, picture, you see the, the very next frame taken without the FMC engaged. And you can see the level of blurring that you get if you don't have a forward motion compensation. Now, I could have flown this with two or three times the shutter speed, you know, really uh, stop down the system, uh, but then that would result in dark and noisy images. So uh, FMC is really a very important feature of these systems. And what this allows us to do is to acquire a high resolution image uh, from uh, both nadir and oblique sensors with good color saturation and low noise like you see in this image here. Uh, the City Mapper 2 system is uh, simplified. It no longer has an external data logger or controller, which eliminates about a half a dozen cables. Uh, it makes the system very uh, simple to install. And because it has a LiDAR system built in, you can accomplish more than you can accomplish with just a camera. Uh, and even in city mapping applications where you think, oh, the oblique camera is gonna cover everything, you can get a significant improvement by adding LIDAR. And you can see that in these left and right images here. The left image is a uh, mesh model created just from oblique imagery. And you can see in the circled areas, there's kind of some fuzzy uh, areas with loss of definition. But when you add back the LIDAR data and augment the mesh with that, you recover some terrific uh, data that has been buried in areas in between the buildings would have been very hard to recover with uh, any kind of purely imaging solution. So that's City Mapper 2 where we are today. <clears throat> um, Terrain Mapper uh, continues on its uh, previous journey and we've uh, had a year of continual developments. Uh, the developments have centered uh, on a number of areas, mostly uh, to improve uh, noise rejection, uh, especially near field noise rejection. This is the bane of any system that uses a uh, gateless multi-pulse in the air feature. 
uh, as all of today's uh, modern LIDAR systems have. Uh, but we also have reduced uh, noise through a combination of software and hardware improvements, developed uh, additional tools for measuring things like surface smoothness, uh, and added those to our array of uh, software uh, products for development of this data. We also continue to uh, add to our library of best practices for our uh, users so that they know the best system settings to use for any given type of mission. Uh, a few parting thoughts about Terrain Mapper. Um, one of the unique features of Terrain Mapper is the constant point density mode. Uh, up at the top of the screen here, you see a, uh, a typical density plot of a sinusoidal type uh, uh, scan pattern, and you get that kind of natural increase in density at the edges of the field of view. With our constant density mode, we can give a kind of an even point density across the entire swath. And this helps to reduce the collection of uh, uh, unneeded or redundant data and also provides a more even density to uh, help the uh, filtering or uh, classification algorithms work more reliably. So that's been a real hit uh, with, with us uh, and with our customers. So what's next for Terrain Mapper? Well, the next thing for Terrain Mapper is to do with it uh, what the market has expected us to do all along. Uh, ever since the introduction of City Mapper 2, uh, last fall, uh, there has been the question coming up of, okay, how can I take advantage of the City Mapper 2 developments in a successor product to Terrain Mapper? And uh, what we have uh, in process now are uh, things like taking advantage of the MFC 150 camera developments uh, on a successor product to Terrain Mapper as well as to continue with further developments of the Hyperion LiDAR unit inside. Uh, we have uh, want to take advantage of improved data logging and packaging that we have from the CityMapper 2 product uh, and improve and make more flexible the processing workflow, all while maintaining the ability to potentially upgrade from a successor configuration to CityMapper 2. Uh, if the user has an expanded need for oblique imagery. So while I won't tell you today what's in the system, uh, what I will tell you is watch Intergeo 2020 and watch the Hexagon website for future announcements. So with that, uh, we'll open it up. I'll uh, pass the mic back to Mark, who's uh, moderating any questions that we might have time for. All right, very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I don't see any questions posted in our Q&A. I do have one for Anders. Um, with regards to your automatic water clarity analysis, how is that reported? Is that reported on a shot-by-shot -shot basis or an area basis? No, it's it's not by shot-by-shot -shot basis. It's 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 uh, it's, um, it's simply the, the the signals are too weak to use from shot-by-shot -shot basis. So it's it's uh, average over larger area. Um, but but uh, still, it, it uh, the water clarity does normally not change that rapidly either. So so it's it's uh, uh, you know if 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 you look on ten meters or twenty meters, you definitely see shifts in in the water clarity. So it's, it's, do, uh, do you have a, a way to output that? Uh, currently not actually, but that's actually uh, absolutely something that we are considering to do because we think that the customers might be uh, interested in that data as well. So uh, in, in the present LSS version, we are not outputting that, uh, unfortunately. Okay, very good. I'd, I'd be interested in seeing that. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and your support. Um, that was uh, very informative.